Uh, okay, uh, so today uh, it's something we've discussed already, but I think it's an important um, topic to, to really delve into and understand. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, limits as they go to infinity and horizontal asymptotes. And so the way that you guys know hor horizontal asymptotes from when you were um, in lower level courses was you typically talked about end behavior, right? What was happening to the, to the right and what was happening to the left as we looked at the end behavior of the function. In essence, what you were really doing there was looking at um, the limits as they take off to infinity. So what we have here is it says let a function, uh, let f be a function defined on some interval from some number a to infinity then the limit of the function as x goes to infinity is going to be some L. Um, the value of f of x can be arbitrarily close to L by taking sufficiently large numbers. Uh, what ends up happening is the line equal to that limit will be called the horizontal asymptote of the curve y equals f of x. And this will happen if either, either the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x approaches L, or if the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is equal to L. Okay, so if, and, and it should make some sense, if I'm going to infinity to the right, Aren't I looking at the end behavior to the right? Right? I'm looking at the end behavior of a function to the right. And if I go to negative infinity, I'm looking at the end behavior going to the left. So one way to think of it is if I had a graph, right, and I had something that looked like, I don't know, um, it did something like this. This is a classic. The end behavior for this is doing what? Where is it tending towards as I go to the right? What y value is it tending towards? Zero. Tending towards zero. So what we end up saying for this problem is it would have a horizontal asymptote equal to zero just by looking at the graph. But if we took the limit of this function as it went to infinity, we would see that it was going to zero and that is the higher level understanding of why the limit or why the um, function has a horizontal asymptote that is specifically y equals zero. Does that make sense? Can you say that again? Yeah, so basically in this problem, what I'm saying is the limit as x would take off to infinity of whatever this function is, is going to be zero, right? Since the limit as it goes to infinity is equal to zero, the horizontal asymptote has to be y equals zero. That's the calculus way of saying we have a horizontal asymptote. Okay? Um, then there's a theorem I'd like to share with you, and this theorem is saying that if r is some number greater than zero, it's a rational number, then what we end up having is this. Uh, the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x to the r is going to be equal to 0. So basically uh, 1 over x to any, any rational exponent is going to have a limit that goes to 0. Okay. And then the same, by the same token, if x goes to negative infinity of 1 over x to the r, that's also going to be equal to 0. So what it's demonstrating here is, the again, end behavior going to the right, end behavior going to the left. One of the important things to note is whenever you're trying to find horizontal asymptotes, you're always going to look for both going to positive infinity and going to negative infinity. Does that make sense? Okay. 
remember that it's it's when I put this on an exam you're gonna have to check both both infinities okay uh, let me do an example for you guys so you guys can see so by the by the theorem that we already have we know that this is going to be equal to zero correct but to demonstrate that the way that we can do this is we're going to use some of the limit laws that we used in the past and so i'm going to take the limit as x goes to infinity of two over the limit as x goes to infinity of x uh, this numerator is going to end up being what value Yeah, it's going to be 2. And the denominator is going to end up being what value? Mm, not x. It should be an infinity. So this is going to be infinity, right? So the way that we want to think about what this value ends up being is this. If I take a fixed number like 2 and I divide it by some astronomically large number, what is this thing going to tend towards? What do you guys think? It should go to zero, correct? Is there any questions on why that is? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so think of it like this. So if I <clears throat> if I used a number isn't like something, isn't it something to the sense of that infinity is so massive that whatever that whatever is on top of it is kind of just a, kind of just gets in gold. Oh yeah, it's swallowed up. But to demonstrate it so you guys can kind of see it, is think of it like this. What's 2 over 10? Isn't that point 0.2? Mm -hmm. Right? So what's 2 over 100? Isn't that point 0.02? Mm -hmm. 2 over 1,000? Isn't that point 0 0.002? So now, look, those are small numbers. But where are they tending towards? They're approaching zero. So imagine two over, <laughs> and yeah. dot, 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 we are going to zero. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the reasoning behind it. Super, super, super small. Okay. Let me do another example for you guys. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so to do this problem here, we have two polynomials, so we know that we can do direct substitution into them, right? Um, but with infinities, it's kind of funky, so we have to play a game, okay? And the game that we're going to play is we're going to factor them and see if we can uh, make these, this uh, rational expression be something that's more manageable. So I'm going to say, okay, the limit as x goes to infinity, and that's going to be x plus 3 over x plus 1 over, uh, what's that, x plus 3 over x minus 2, right? Those are the correct factors. And so this should cancel this. And so what I'm going to end up having is the limit as x goes to infinity of x plus 1 over x minus 2. And then let's see. All right, let's plug in. Let's plug in infinity and see what happens. So if I plug in infinity, what am I going to get in the numerator? Very big number. A very big number, right? Look, huge. We're going to get infinity. Okay? And if we plug in infinity in the denominator, what are we going to get? Mm. No, we're going to get a very big number. That would be infinity as well, wouldn't it? Correct. So we end up with infinity over infinity. And if you have infinity over infinity, is that equal to 1? Mm -hmm. No. We don't know. So don't make that mistake. We don't know. Because <laughs> one infinity may be different than another infinity. It's not undefined. So don't get that twisted. But one infinity may be slightly bigger than the other infinity. 
Okay, so uh, we don't know, so we need to do more trickery to this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this cool little trick. I'm gonna divide top and bottom by uh, x, or I'll multiply by one over x. Doesn't that give me one plus one over x over one minus two over x? Correct? Okay, trick that we learned today. What is this equal to? If I apply the limit. Three? Zero. What about this one? Yeah. Zero. So now what we end up with is one over one, which is equal to one. Okay. Uh, I don't want you to get it twisted that the answer is one infinity over infinity, because that's not true. I could change this problem just a little bit. If I had to put a two here, wouldn't that problem right there still be infinity over infinity? Right? Wouldn't this be still infinity over infinity? But this would actually still have a two, which would mean this would become a two, which means the answer here would be a two. So uh, don't, don't mess that up. Be careful right. with that. Can you tell me why you divided everything by x in like the third step? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's just one of the tricks that we do. Um, since we're going to infinity, we definitely know we're not going to be dividing by zero. So it's safe to divide by any number that x ends up being. So it ends up being an algebraic trick that we can do. Okay, thank you. Uh, so again, just explaining the two piece. So if I had had a two here, okay, we said that that would have been infinity and this would have been infinity, right? So if we would have said infinity or infinity, oh, that equals one. I'm trying to show you that that's a mistake. And here's why. Because this would end up having a two here, correct? So what's two X over X end up being? The X's could cancel and this would become a two, right? Do you guys follow me? And so that would mean this is the two. So then this is two over one which ends up being two. So infinity of infinity in this case is equal to two. It's pretty crazy. Um, and I'll do a bunch of problems where what you think is the, what infinity should be ends up being something totally different. Um, one of the things that's actually quite, quite odd is infinity is something that isn't um, obvious, right? So if I take the whole numbers, they're infinite whole numbers, correct? Right? Huge, infinite whole numbers. But I'm telling you that the numbers between zero and one are bigger than the whole numbers. Does that make sense? So, huh? Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So if we take the whole numbers, right? The whole numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? The numbers between 0 and 1, there's more numbers between 0 and 1 than there is from 0 to uh, infinity for whole numbers. And I'll show you just real quick. So if I have zero, one, two, three, four, five, you see what's happening, right? Between zero and one, I'll make it big. All I have to do is take the reciprocals of the numbers, right? Zero is gonna be zero. One is there, so they're the same. One, or, or two is the same, takes a place of one half, right? Three, one third, smaller one-fourth, one-fifth, 
one sixth. Do you see that all the whole numbers end up falling in between here after five? Oh, okay. okay. We never even dealt with this section of numbers from zero to one. And we haven't even dealt with the irrationals. We've only dealt with the rational numbers. Do you guys see what I'm saying? So the whole numbers is huge. It's, in, it's, in, it's infinity. But between zero and one, the rational numbers between zero and one are way, way bigger. That should trip you guys out, actually. <laughs> okay. So understanding infinity and things like that is far more abstract um, than we realize. Okay? So be careful. Uh, question? Sure. Um, so for this example that we were just doing, um, what would be the actual answer? One? Or is that you just checking? Oh, no, no. The answer is one in this case. This is the answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll highlight it or box it so you guys know. That is the answer to this problem. Uh, here, let me do a different... Uh, let me do this problem a different way uh, so you guys can see. Um, instead of factoring out, I could have done the problem this way. So it's x squared plus 4x plus 3 over x squared plus x minus 6. And what I could have done here is a trick that you guys should know from uh, Algebra 2 where your teacher just said um, the... Oh, by the way, that would have been the horizontal asymptote, right? Since we're going to infinity. If I was asking for the horizontal asymptote. But looking at this problem here... Your teacher said if you wanted to find the horizontal asymptote, you could divide by the highest power, right, of the leading term, and that would give you the horizontal asymptote. Um, so in this problem, the highest power is x squared, so I'm going to divide everything by x squared. Just showing you another way. So what ends up happening to this, 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 and this? As I apply the limit to those, what do they become? Zero. They all become zero, right? Um, and I'll write it so it's clean so you guys can see. Because it'd be the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 plus 4 over x plus 3 over x squared over 1 plus 1 over x minus 6 over x squared. And you can see that those all fall under that theorem that I gave you. As it goes to infinity, they are equal to 0. Right? And so we end up with 1 over 1, which is that same answer that we had of 1. So, um, like all of those turn into zero because of like that theorem that we just learned? Yeah, but you can also look at the picture, right? So like if I had four, 4 over x, I know that the picture of 4 over x looks something like this, correct? Mm -hmm. Right? Because I know how to graph and I know what this looks like. I can do it like that. What's happening to the end behavior as I go to positive infinity? To zero. It's going to zero. But instead of having to look at the picture, I can use the theorem and say, oh, look, uh, 1 over x to the r, if it's going to infinity, either positive or negative, is going to be zero. And so, like, because it says 1, but it's like when it's like 4x or x or 6 or 3 or any of those, so, like we can assume. So, no, no, you're, you're not assuming. You're absolutely 100% right. 5 over infinity is going to go where? Zero. Hey, let's make it bold. 
a billion over infinity is going to go where? Zero. The numerator becomes, since it's a constant, is irrelevant. We're going to go to zero. Okay. Okay? It's a good question. Okay. We did a problem like this last time, right? And I told you a trick to do this problem, correct? Right? Yeah. Uh, so with this problem, um, in order to be able to do it when we have uh, radicals, I told you to multiply by the Conjugate. By the conjugate. Thank you. No, no worries. Yeah. No worries. I'm not judging you. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's going to happen is in the numerator. Uh, please tell me if I'm going too fast because I don't want to freak you guys out. I end up getting x squared minus x squared minus 2x over x minus x squared plus 2x. Is everyone okay with that or did I skip too many steps? I think I'm good. Okay. Now, now what I'm going to do, ooh, let me mute you guys just so we don't, I get like a ringing. Okay, um, so then from here, I'm going to get the limit as x approaches negative infinity, and I'm going to end up with a negative 2x over x minus the root of x squared plus 2x. And here comes the big play. In the previous problem, what I did is I divided by, um, I divided by x top and bottom, right? Or I divided by x squared top and bottom, correct? Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that same principle, but something interesting is going to happen. So this is critical that you guys pay attention to this. So the limit as x goes to negative infinity if I divide the top by x and the bottom by x, when I go into the root, that x becomes what? No, 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 no. It's, it's going to be a variable piece, right? So that x going into the root is going to become x squared. Right? Because if I had 2 outside of the root, when I put 2 into the root, it becomes 4. Right? Because square root of 4 is 2. So if 2 is outside and I want to put it in a root, I have to make it become 4. Correct? But something critical happens. Where am I going? X is approaching what? So this has to become a plus. Do you guys know why? Because it's coming from the right? No. Uh, no, it's because x is actually negative x, right? Because I can't write it as negative x. Um, it's coming from the, the negative x position. So uh, if I have x and I put it into a root, it has to become x squared, right? But didn't I tell you that the square root of x squared is absolute value of x? Last time? And in absolute value of x, the definition is twofold. It's negative x or x, right? I even said zero. So this one is this, this is this, this is as if x is less than zero. Well, aren't we in the x's that are less than zero in this case? I 
I know this is a big, <laughs> this is a, this is algebra, guys. I told you, you're going to learn some algebra. This isn't calculus, it's algebra. Does it make sense then when I get uh, in here x squared under the root that this really is absolute value of x? So then I need to assess, is it a positive x or a negative x? Well, since we're going to negatives, we have to put the negative out, which it was a minus before, so now it becomes a plus. If I had been going to positive infinity, would I have changed this sign? No. No. Okay, okay. Okay, someone asked a question. Let me see. Uh, is x under the root supposed to be 2x, or did something happen to... Oh, oh, yes, thank you, I blew that. This should be a two, thank you. Because that piece, this is, that's the x squared piece, the two x should still be two x. Oh, and it should be positive in there. This should still be a plus. The only thing that changes is the, um, the only thing that changes is the uh, value the sign in front of the root. Are we okay with that? So this case is going to happen. Um, this case is going to happen uh, quite a bit. So it's important you guys understand it. Okay. Okay, that's good, Carol. I'm glad you feel better. Um, that's that's my job, right? I'm supposed to make you guys feel comfortable with this stuff, and then you're supposed to go grind it and really absorb it to make it your own. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. Now, from here then, I'm gonna get the limit as x goes to negative infinity, um, and I'm gonna get a negative two over one plus one plus two over x, correct? Mm -hmm. So what's gonna happen to this? What is this gonna become? Zero. That's zero. Good. And so we're going to end up with negative 2 over 1 plus 1, which is a negative 1. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We okay? Any questions that I can clarify for you guys? Because I, I definitely want to make you guys feel comfortable. Okay, so we got to remember that the square root can give one of three, one of the three. Um, and we got to pick the one that's appropriate for the problem we are working on. In this case, as the limit approaches negative two. Yes. So um, if it's zero, that's not going to be uninteresting. So we're either going to care if it's going to positive infinity or to negative infinity. And then what that does is when we take an x and put it inside of the root, we need to decide, do we change the sign in front of the root so that we get the right answer? Does that make sense? Uh, so I'll show you guys in a concrete example, okay? And I did it last time with you guys, but I want to show it again. So if I had... Um, negative 2 and I put it into the root and square it I need to use the negative case here and I'll do it in a different color in order to be able to get the correct answer of negative 2 does that make sense if I had the positive case uh, ooh, I should make this, uh, um, let me make this negative four. That way it's clear. Uh, no, no, no. I was right. What am I tripping on? Negative two works. <clears throat> now, if I did the positive case, right, two, that would be the square root of two squared. Do I need a negative or do I need a change of sign in front of that one?
I don't need to do anything to the second case, right? Because it's positive, this being absolute value of two, it's positive, so I can just leave it that way. In this case, because it's negative in there, I need to take the absolute value, and I have to throw the negative out in front. We okay? All right. Um, you got to expect that I'm going to give you something like this on an exam. I've talked about it two days, right? So if I'm spending that kind of time on it, that means, hey, this guy's going to come after us with something like this. So, um, and it will be in the homework, so please practice it. Uh, please be aware of it, okay? Would the question like this also ask for the horizontal asymptote? It will eventually, yes. Um, um, right now, it's just getting you to understand how to find the horizontal and um, you, uh, later on in chapter four, I'll talk about how to find um, in depth, how to find the vertical asymptote, which I showed you guys how to do that already. Um, yeah. But I'm going to use it to graph. And so you're going to have to demonstrate these to be able to point out where's the horizontal asymptote, where's the vertical asymptote. So that will be coming. Um, I won't ask that on this first exam, though. Okay. Yeah, I know on the second homework, number 12 already had asked for a vertical asymptote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've shown you that, right? The six cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, right. Thank you. Yep. All right. Are you guys feeling comfortable with 2.6? It's not too bad? Okay. Um, may I go on to 2.7? Yeah? All right. Cool. All right. 2.7. Look at all these notes for you guys. All right, here is uh, two seven. Um, <clears throat> okay, so in two seven, we're going to finally start talking about the derivative um, and rates of change. And so, um, rates of change you can think of as um, secants can be a rate of change, right? Slope is a rate of change. Um, the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change. So um, the language that's used is important. Okay, so be very, very careful with that and know that the language that's being used is imperative to know what the problem is asking. Okay, so um, the tangent line, we've already done it. I'm giving you a new definition for it, is this one. Now I'm using f of a plus h minus f of a all over h, and I'm having h go to zero, okay? Um, because I didn't teach you guys the precise definition of the limit, um, this doesn't make a lot of sense, but I'll explain it to you guys. h basically is the distance to the number that we want to get to. So if the distance to the number that we want to get to is approaching zero, what are we doing? Aren't we getting closer and closer to that exact point that we want to find? That's what this is. That's what the precise definition talked about. We're going to have error, but the closer and closer we get to zero, the better and better we're going to get to an approximation of the tangent via sequence. Okay? So this is just another definition. So now, um, I'm introducing what a derivative is. The derivative is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. But it was also the one that I showed you last time where I said the slope of the tangent. Do you remember that? The slope of the tangent was the limit as, um, uh, what definition did I give you? x sub 1 goes to x naught of f of x sub 1 minus f, f of x naught all over x1 minus x0. That's another definition for it. Don't worry, I'll write all three of them down for you so you have them, there are three. Um, but let me let me just use them here. So here, I'll write one of them down for you right now. So the, li so the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a is also the definition of the derivative, okay? Both of those are definitions to the derivative, and we're going to be using them quite a bit. 
Okay, so we have a problem. Here's this example. It says find the rate of change of the following, right? Since we're only looking for a rate of change and I'm giving you a specific amount of time, see how it says lasting 0.1 seconds? What we're looking for here is simply a secant. We're not looking for um, the instantaneous or the derivative in this case. We're looking for a secant. And so in this problem to find the secant, um, I'm going to go uh, 45 times 4.1 minus 4.1 squared, right? Isn't that the y value of the function after it's been 4.1 seconds? Right? If it lasted... 0.1 seconds, didn't we start at 4? So the new input should be 4.1? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Now, that's my first y value. My original y value would have been 45 times 4 minus 4 squared right that would be my y value um, at that four right basically what i'm doing here is i'm finding the slope of the two points at four and at 4.1 okay so then this is going to be 4.1 minus four and this is in fact just the slope between these two points well this ends up being um 184.5 minus what is that? 16.81 minus, what is that? 9180 minus 16 all over 0.1. And so that's going to give me 167.69 minus 164 over 0.1, which is 3.69 over 0.1 which gives me 36.9 whatever the units are for this thing per second does that make sense so it'll be units per second because remember that a secant and a um, a tangent end up being a rate of change and in this case, we know it's per second. So position change per second. And position change per second is a velocity or a speed, right? Okay. Are, are you guys feeling overwhelmed or are you guys okay? So this is using that formula, like up there? No, so this one, I didn't use the formula that's up there. I actually used this one. And the reason you know that is you see how there's a, a x minus a? Uh -huh. This one only has h. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll use one where I only use h. Um, it's coming. You're not going to like it, but it's coming. Okay. So, the important ideas that I talked about. Um, average velocity is a secant. Right? Instantaneous velocity is a tangent. So it's the one that's going to use the limit. The one without the limit is an average velocity. The one with the limit is an instantaneous velocity. Okay? So when questions are asked of you, you're going to want to know is it instantaneous or is it average? Does that make sense? All right. Here, let me do this next example, and we'll go from there. Okay, so in this example, it says find the slope of the tangent. So if we're looking for the slope of the tangent, we're looking for the one that uses the limit. 
Okay? So as soon as it says the word tangent, we're looking for a limit. Cool? And it says for this curve at the point one zero. So if it's giving us the point one zero, this is my A, this is my F of A. So I already have a point. Are we okay with that? Yes? Yes. Okay. So then from here, I'm going to use the limit as x approaches a. Oh, and my a in this case is what? It's 1, right? My a is 1. Are you using it? I'm sorry, I just muted you because other people were unmuting themselves. So can you say that again? Um, are you using the formula that you used at the beginning? So I'm using the f of a, uh, I'm using this one. So the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Okay, thank you. Just so you know. I'll, I'll explain when I, when I use the other one and why I use the other one in just a bit. But in this case, because I'm given a point, I'm given f of a and I'm given a and f of a, it's just useful to use that one. Okay? So the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus x cubed, um, and then it's minus 0 over... Uh, x minus 1. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So then from here, the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus x cubed over x minus 1 is the problem that we're given. So then I'm going to try to factor out some things and see if it will help me. So I'm going to factor out an x, and I'm going to get 1 minus x squared over x minus 1. But I see I have a difference of squares, so I'm going to get the limit as x approaches 1 of x times 1 minus x, 1 plus x over x minus 1. But I see I can almost cancel stuff if I had pulled out a negative sign. Correct? So if I pull out a negative sign, I'm going to get the limit as x approaches 1 of negative x of uh, x minus 1, 1 plus x over x minus 1, which will allow me to cancel these two. So the limit as x approaches 1 of negative x, 1 plus x. Now I can directly substitute in. And so what I'm going to get is negative 1 times 1 plus 1, which is going to be a negative 1 times 2, which gives me an answer of negative 2. So the slope of the tangent line is negative 2. We all right? Uh, I had a question. Please. Why did why did you turn the x negative the very first x in the equation? Oh, right here. Uh, yeah, right there. Okay. So you notice right here it's one minus x. Yeah. And this is x minus one. So if I factor out a, a negative from here, that's going to be positive x, and that's going to become a minus 1. Okay, you did it in order to cancel them, right? To be able to get this to cancel. Okay, I got it. Okay. Thank uh, you. Another question regarding that. Yeah. Um, why did you take out the negative from the other equation next to the 1 plus x? Uh, you got a negative from there too, or? Uh, why didn't I pull it out of here? Okay. Well, 
on a negative thing? No, so like, so if I would have pulled out a negative here, uh -huh. this would have become a negative x minus one, right? Okay. But then there would have been another negative out there which would have become positive. Mm -hmm. And so then I would have plugged in, this would have been a positive one, but then this would have been negative one minus one, which would have given me the negative two. Oh, so you still got the same result, no? You get the same result, but it's, why would you take a negative out of each term? You only need to take it out of the one that you want to cancel. Oh, uh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Good question. Okay. Uh, let's do another example. Uh, do you guys want to try it? It's very similar to the one we just did. Do you guys want to try? Yeah, why don't you guys try it and then I'll do it. Just let me know when you're ready, okay? How many of you guys are stuck on factoring?
it's a bummer. I can't see what you guys are doing. <laughs> so I could give you some guidance. Are you guys, <clears throat> is anyone stuck on the factory? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I uh, I would put X plus one. Um, yeah, yeah. Try try eventually to get to the equation if you can. Um, it, it will eventually become X plus one in the denominator. I'm sure a lot of you. got to here and then got stuck. Were you able to go beyond that? Or did most of you get stuck here? Uh, it makes sense that that would happen uh, because the numerator is factorable, but you need to know how to factor it. So uh, there's a few ways to do it. Oh, that's funny. <clears throat> the factorization ends up being this. <laughs> Do you guys know how I got that? <laughs> so, um, we have 2x cubed minus 5x minus 3, right? And I'm going to use synthetic division to do it. So it's 2x cubed minus 5x minus 3. And I know that p over q are the options for the factors of this thing, correct? If we're going to have rational um, factors. And I want it to be specifically negative one, right? Mm -hmm. So since I specifically want it to be negative one, I'm gonna try negative one and see what happens. Okay, but one of the things that we wanna do with synthetic is we need to go plus zero x squared minus five x minus three. You guys remember that, right? From your intermediate algebra class? So the two comes down and then I'm gonna get um, uh, two here, that's going to be uh, a negative two. Um, so this becomes negative two. Uh, then that's going to become a positive two, which is going to give me a negative three x. Um, oops, no x, I'm sorry. Negative three, and then that's going to give me a positive three, which is going to give me zero. Right? And then the powers drop one. So then it's going to be 2x squared minus 2x minus 3. That times x minus a negative 1, which is x plus 1. But this means that you have all of your tools that you know from algebra 1 and algebra 2. It's terrible, right? <laughs> then from here, um, I can erase that because I already have it over here. Uh, this is going to cancel, so I'm going to get uh, the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 2x squared minus 2x minus 3. And so when I directly substitute now, I'm going to get 2 plus 2 minus 3 which is going to give me a slope of 1, correct? What was like the substitute thing? The direct substitution? Yeah, just like, because like the x squared mm -hmm. and like the x. And yeah, stuff. so so what's going to happen here is... Oh, you, you put in 1, but it was just 1. I, so put, like, I put in negative 1. Oh, okay. Right? Because yeah. the, it's this is a polynomial, and polynomials I can directly substitute into... And so I end up with the one, okay. right? And so yeah. Uh, yeah. to get the, to get the equation, I'm given a point, right? Here's the point. I have a slope. I'm going to use point slope. 
So I'm going to get y minus 3 is equal to 1 times x plus 1. That is the equation of the tangent line. Or if you wanted to do it in slope intercept form, it would be y is equal to x plus 4. Either one of those equations would work. I think on web assign, they typically want the slope intercept form, but either one of them works. <laughs> 4, 1. That's right. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's pretty cool math. All right, now I'm about to drive you nuts. Are you guys ready? I guess so. Okay. Now, one thing that's important is remember synthetic. Uh, division as an option for finding factors. Okay, it's a tool that will be needed and used. Um, Ray, you need some more time to write this stuff down? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Isn't math pretty cool? <laughs> Or is it just me that thinks that? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely clever. It's a, it's, it's, it's a game. Um, I think I became obsessed with it because I thought of it as puzzles. Um, and I, I love puzzles. And so, um, yeah, I just got obsessed. All right, so here we go. Let's do this problem. Um, now, in this case, look at what it says. It says a rock is thrown upward on the planet Mars. And we did one like this, right? Um, its height after t seconds was given by this. Find the velocity of the rock after one second. So they're only giving us one number. We could have done it. Um, we could have done this uh, using... Uh, uh, is it possible for us to use... Um, the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a? The answer is yes, right? We could have plugged the 1 in and found out what the y value has gone from there. But this time I want to use, because I can do it with any of them, I want to use the limit as h goes to 0. Okay? And I'm going to show you how to use that. So the definition is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h, okay? So what is my a in this case? That's the important piece. What number am I approaching? No, not 10. It's where it's asking us to find the velocity. Where is it asking me to find the velocity? The limit two? Because it's after one second, or would it be one? It's at one second. So see how it's saying find the velocity of the rock after one second? So what we're trying to do is find the limit as, as, as our f of a is one. Our a is one. The limit in this case is h going to zero. But we're approaching an a of one. Does that make sense? Okay. So then from here, since I know my h is 1, I'm going to get the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 all over h. Okay. Now, we're using, we're using function notation. And since we're using function notation, uh, it's about to get cumbersome okay and here's what's going to happen i'm going to get the limit as h goes to zero of 10 times 1 plus h minus 1.86 1 plus h squared minus f of 1 uh, which is going to be 10 times 1 minus 1.86 times 1 all over h. 
So you can see how this one's a little bit more cumbersome, right? And so what I'm going to get is the limit as h goes to 0 of 10 plus 10h minus, uh, and I'll just do this in my head, um, minus 2 times 1.86 is 3.72h, uh, and then um, minus uh, 1.86h squared. <laughs> I should have moved it over a little bit. Um, bummer. Um, minus 10h plus 1.86. All of that over h. Is that okay? Or do you want me to rewrite it and move it over? It's up to you guys. Yeah, you okay with that? Okay. So things that can be eliminated. Uh, the 10 will be... Ooh, I left out a 10 too. Yeah. Uh, 1.86. Yeah, there's no H there's no H on this one, my bad. That should just be minus ten. So that ten is gonna eliminate with this ten. Um the one point eight six will be eliminated with this one point eight six, correct? And so we're left with uh three terms. And those three terms, I'm gonna get the limit as H goes to zero of 10h minus 3.72h minus 1.86h squared all over h. But guess what we can do? Can you guys see something that we can do? Can't we cancel the h's? Right? So if we cancel the h's, I'm going to get the limit as h goes to 0. Uh, what's 10h minus 3.72? Isn't that uh, 6.28 minus 1.86h? Do you guys agree with that? Now, when I apply the limit to this, what's going to be left? What do we get? That's right. We're going to get 6.28, but we know it's meters per second in this problem. I should put parentheses around this just so it's proper. Right? 6.28 meters per second. Are we okay with that? Okay. Now, for part B, it says find the velocity of the rock when we're at time A. Okay? And so to do that... One, one quick question on part uh, A, the first part. Sure. Uh, when, when, you, uh, when you got three, negative 3.72H, where'd you get that from? Sure. So I, I did some multiplication in my head. Um, this right here ends up being 1 plus 2H... Uh, plus h squared, correct? Yeah. So then 1.86 times 2 is that 3.72. Oh, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you multiplied it times 2h? Correct. Because of the ex because of this expansion here. Oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it, I get it. Got it? Okay. Good question. Like I said, uh, there's times that I'm going to take things for granted or I do them in my head, and um, call me on it. I'll explain it, okay? I'm actually grateful that you guys are so far. Most of the time, my classes are so damn quiet, they're all afraid of me. Am I that scary? 
Or is it just the math is? <laughs> the math is very intimidating. Uh, it's just practice. You guys will get it. Um, and I want you guys to feel comfortable. So um, just talk to me and, and, and I'll help you. Okay, so for this next one, um, we're trying to find it at time is equal to A. So if time is equal to A, the A in this value is A. I know that's not interesting at all, but so we're going to get the limit as H approaches zero of, oh, it should have been P of T. I put F, whatever. Um, F of A, oops, using the definition, right? F of A plus H minus F of A um, all over H. And you could put P if you want. I'm just using the same notation that I used from before. But it probably, ah, yeah, okay, dang it. This should be a P. I should be disciplined instead of being lazy. Uh, this should be a P. This should be a P. Because it's named P, right? Uh, okay. So then if we're going to do this, then everywhere that we see um, T, we're going to put A plus H. And everywhere we see T, we're going to put A, right? So P of A plus H is going to be um, 10 times A plus H minus 1.86 A plus H squared minus 10A, and I should put this in parentheses or a bracket, 1.86 a squared. Agreed? Yes. Okay. Then expanding this, I'm going to get the limit as h goes to 0 of 10a plus 10h minus 1.86a squared minus 3.72 a h minus 1.86 h squared minus 10 a plus 1.86 a squared all over that should be h. Did I expand too quickly? Can you need me to explain that? A second to catch up. Let me know when you're ready. Person, but how are the rest of you? You okay? Okay, so then let's see what things can be eliminated. I have a 10a and a minus 10a. I think I'm good. Sorry. What's that, Nathan? I'm sorry. Oh no, I think, think, I think I'm good now. Oh, okay. I'm just going to start eliminating things. Um, it looks like I can get rid of 1.86 a squared and 1.86 a squared and then we look we're left with three terms just like before um, but I'm gonna pull out an H so I'm gonna have the limit as H goes to 0 here's an H so I'm gonna get 10 minus 3.72 a minus 1.86 H all over H which will then give me the limit as h goes to 0 of 10 minus 3.72a minus 1.86h. Oops, I don't know. I must have hit the little space bar. 
And so when I apply the limit, don't I end up with 10 minus 3.72a? Right? Because 10 is a constant. Um, <clears throat> negative 3. Point, um, negative 3.7a is a constant. Um, but the 1.86h, that has h, so the limit must be applied to that. So this ends up being our result. Now, what's cool about this is this is a derivative. So at any a for this function, if I wanted to find out what the slope would be or what the velocity would be, at 1, it's 10 minus 3.72. At 2, it'd be 10 minus, uh, what is that, 7.44. Do you guys get what I'm doing? I'm just plugging in values now for whatever my a is. So now I don't have to do all of these steps up here. By having the derivative, I can now just plug in to this and find out what the slope is for this thing in general. Isn't that cool? You think that's gonna be a time saver? Mm. Big time, big time. So why did you remove the uh, negative 1.86h like at the end? Cause you were like, we're gonna take like the limit. Here? Yeah. So when I apply the limit, what's got h? Only this. Oh. Um, What's 1.86 um, times zero? Okay. That's like plugging it in. Yeah, it's the direct okay. substitution. <clears throat> okay. Now, the next part to this problem is asking, when is this thing going to hit the surface? Well, notice that our problem was <clears throat> a height function problem, right? So we can see that it's a height function problem. In fact, let me, uh, right here, it says it's a height function problem. And since it's a height function problem, I want to know when the height is going to be what if it's going to hit the surface. Zero. Zero. So this isn't even a calculus question. It's just telling me, hey, can you find out when this is going to happen? So then, Zero is going to be equal to t and 10 minus 1.86t. So it's either at zero seconds or when 10 minus 1.86t is equal to zero. And that looks like it would be t is equal to 10 divided by 1.86, which I don't know what that is. What is that? Um, let me get a calculator. 10 divided by 1.86. It'd be approximately 5.37 seconds. Make sense? Now the next question, and this is cool, it says, what, with what velocity will the rock hit the surface, right? Well, <clears throat> we now know that at 5.37 seconds, it's going to hit it. And so I could do the whole first step and um, use 5.37 seconds and do the whole definition like I did up here. So instead of using uh, 1, I could have plugged in uh, 5.376 or 5.37 but I don't want to do it that way that's too much damn work I'm lazy so instead I'm going to use my shortcut my derivative it makes my life way easier and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go okay uh, what the heck is the velocity the velocity is going to be 10 minus 3.72 times and I'm just going to approximate it this time, 3.7 seconds. 
And so that's going to give me, uh, in fact, there might be a better way to do it. There is a better way. Instead of using the approximation, I'm just going to use the fraction. And here's why. Uh, doesn't um, doesn't 1.86 go into 3.72? It goes into it twice. So I'm going to go 10 minus 2 times 10, which will be 10 minus 20, which means it's going to hit the ground going at negative 10 meters per second. Now, does that make sense? Velocity is velocity is a vector, and so it's got magnitude, the 10, and it's got direction. Well, if it's falling towards the ground, shouldn't it be going negative? So this is correct to the reasoning of the problem. I went up, and then I was coming down, and so the velocity on the downward side is, has to be negative once I've passed the apex, right? Does that make sense? So I see, like, I know that, like, 1.86 goes into 3.72 twice, but mm -hmm. it's like, how do you get it to be that to, like, do you multiply it by 1.6, or, or you, oh, you just, like, divide them? Yeah, 3.72 divided by 1.86. Okay. So, so in numbers, right, if I have A times B minus C, algebra, I can go A over C times B, right? And so in this case, I have 3.72, 10, and 1.86. So now I can go 3.72 divided by 1.86 times 10. That's 2 times 10. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, God bless algebra. It's, it's going to always punch us in the gut. <laughs> okay, uh, are there any questions on this? No? We're good? Okay, I'm going to stop recording here and then see if you guys have any questions on anything else. Hold on one second.